Though Atari stopped development of the Jaguar back in 1995, they still had a sizable back stock of inventory, a number of games deep in development, and a lot of cash on hand. This was due to a 1994 court settlement between Sega and Atari, which saw Sega acquire $40 million in Atari stock, which equaled about 7.5% of the company. In addition, Sega gave Atari an additional $50 million to settle the suit and acquire licensing from Atari, which Atari claimed Sega was in violation of using without authorization. The deal would also include licensing rights to Sega games, which made sense as Sega was now a major shareholder. The money Sega infused into Atari looked to be a huge blessing, as Atari, who was once strapped for cash, was able to set up licensing deals for a number of games bringing New Hope to a system that was once on the ropes. Atari was hoping to salvage the JAG, so a number of new projects were started with the intention of rectifying early mistakes. Even with a strong showing at the 95E3, along with the newly announced games, the system still sat on shelves, and in mid-95, Atari pulled the plug. It's an important piece of the Jaguar puzzle that Atari won the Sega lawsuit and with Sega's money was able to fund many of the projects that would later be released along with a truckload that were later abandoned. It's another insight into how a system which sold so poorly could have so many games in development. This is Retro Impressions Unreleased Atari Jaguar. I'm going to cover the rules, then jump right into it. The rules for inclusion are simple. There has to be some proof that the game was in development. Be it in an article in a magazine, known copy of a prototype, a retail order sheet, an interview with a developer, etc. With that, let's get started. There were attempts to port games from the Alone in the Dark series to nearly every system under the sun, so it finds itself on quite a few lists of unreleased games, including this one here. It was a survival horror game that almost certainly would have benefited the system had it released. As the game was dependent on the CD add-on due to its size, there is not a lot of mystery as to why it was cancelled. What exactly was the architect? That's the question still on my mind as I wrap up this script. Atari numbered their games with J9 and a rolling three-digit number that started with double lot zero, which was a sign to Cybermorph. This number continued on in sequential order as games were put into production. Of the first 14 numbers assigned, up to 4 were never released, while at least 2 had code names. J9001 was called Sideshooter, later released as Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy. J9012 was Ninja Puncher, later released as Katsumi Ninja. And J9004, that's the architect. As these numbers followed games even to their death, the only thing that's certain is that it didn't release under any other name. Was this a game about building cities, bridges, or altogether something else? At this point, no one knows for sure what the story is behind the fifth game greenlit for the system. Assault Covert Ops is approximately what you might imagine. You're part of a Covert Ops team doing missions on foreign soil. Haiti, North Korea, Somalia, Iraq, and Yugoslavia were all planned locations. Oddly enough, there wasn't a ton of press on this one, but a retail order sheet was sent out indicating that the game was fairly far along in development. Though the game would never see release, its developer Midnight Entertainment was also working on another title which they did release. That being the incredibly rare Air Cars. Air Cars, for its part, was finished and reviewed in 95, but not released as Midnight Entertainment was out of money forcing them to shelve the game. Aircar sat on shelves for two years before being picked up for limited distribution by IDC, who also made the very rare Catbox. The game saw an official release only being available by mail order in 97 and shipped without a box. With that said, I think it's fairly clear that bankruptcy is the sole reason Assault Cover Ops was cancelled. Battle Chess was mentioned in a few magazines as an upcoming title. It was originally a PC game ported to just about every home and microcomputer system, including the ST, so it's no real surprise that it was also planned for the Jaguar, as every system needs a good chess game. Biosphere was a game in development for the 32X, 3DO, PC, and Jaguar CD. Information about the developer Zinc Studios' fate is hard to come by. 
Thankfully, we have some info giving a bit of insight into this game, including a sales flyer sent out to potential retailers. You live in a biodome on Earth, and that dome is failing. Cue the epic adventure. The developers Inc. Studios described their game as an action adventure with puzzle elements. Nearing the Winter CES show of 1995, the game was still under development with some consideration of putting together a demo for the show. There was also serious consideration given to showing Biosphere at E3, but there is no record of this happening. Although the development team had stated their game was nearing release, what we are left with are some screenshots as the game was never shown in public. On a side note, this was connected to the video game Jukebox, which was also planned and later cancelled for the Jaguar and Genesis. I think the story of Ringler Studios' relationship with Atari is one of the most interesting to tell of this series. The studio was responsible for a number of sports titles, with Hockey for the Lynx really capturing the attention of the press and Atari executives. As a deal was already in the works to bring over Brett Hall Hockey and Barkley Shut Up and Jam, Ringler Studios, who had a fantastic working relationship with Atari, was given the contract to develop these new Jaguar sports titles. This was no small deal. Atari at the time felt great sports games and name recognition was required for the Jaguar to be successful. This meant they were counting on Ringler to do something special with both games. Atari's typical finance schedule was put in place, releasing partial payments upon the completion of different predetermined milestones. In addition to this, an upfront sum of $100,000 was also given to Ringler for the purpose of adding additional digitized high-res characters into each game. Both games were on track for a mid-95 release, hitting their first four milestones with ease. At the start of 95, Atari brought on board John Carell, naming him the new VP of software. Surprisingly, Ed Ringler knew John Carell from years past, as Ed was president of Design Star Consultants and had turned down Carell's offer to join the company. Hard feelings were had on both sides as John and Ed parted ways, so meeting again under this circumstance was a bit of a shock to Ed, who had hoped his days of dealing with Carell were behind him. Ed was surprised to learn that Carell would now be his liaison to Atari, and would be arriving later in January for a meeting aimed at reviewing his team's work. From Ed's perspective, the meeting which happened on January 24th was nothing more than Carell trying to settle the score. As you know, on January 24th, Ringler Studios met with Atari's new VP of software, John Carell. As you may also know by now, that visit was an absolute disaster. Never in my life, let alone in this industry, have I ever had such an unpleasant, pointless, destructive meeting with an individual. Corell wasted no time in insulting and criticizing everyone he was introduced to and everything he was shown. But his greatest pleasure seemed to come from barking orders at me, as if I were now his employee. Ed would go on to claim that John picked apart their projects, telling the development team they didn't have the skill to complete or deliver the game's promise to Atari. In addition to this, Ringler was upset that outstanding funds attached to finished milestones from prior Lynx games had not been released to them, and that assets required to finish the fifth milestone of both JAG games had yet to be delivered. Even though the fifth milestone was on hold awaiting the completion of the digitized graphics, Ed asked for the release of those funds as the milestone requirements for the fifth and sixth were close to completion, with the seventh and eighth well underway. The final and probably most important bit was Ringler Studios asked to be released from their contract if Atari insisted John Carell continue to have oversight on their projects. Sam Tremell responded calling into question Ringler's use of funds, their time management, and if Atari had indeed not fulfilled requests Ringler's had made that directly stopped progression on certain milestones. A big part of this disagreement seemed to revolve around forgotten or lost promises made by the past VP of software. These promises were either not understood, disregarded, or not known by Carell or Trammell. The situation was quite contentious, and though we know Sam Trammell's and Ed Ringler's perspective on these events, almost nothing is known from John Carell's point of view beyond two documents. The most important being an executive review of games John put together two days before his first meeting with Ringler, and I think it's the most telling. Video not done. Four months behind possible August 95 release. Developer unstable and employee morale questionable. Recommendation? If we can do an NHL 95, we should scrap BH in favor unless we get required information and cooperation from developer. 
it seems to me Corel's mind was made up prior to meeting with Ringler Studios. What's not clear is what exactly happened going forward. Tensions seem to remain high as Atari demanded Ringler remain on board to finish the game under Corel's direction. While I can't directly comment on their Barkley game, Atari only had licensing rights to Brett Hall Hockey until April of 96, a deadline Ringler Studios would never deliver on as Corel continued to reject the game. So whose fault was it? That's impossible to say, but prototype versions for both games have been dumped online and are easily accessible. It's unknown how close these ROMs are to the final version Ringler Studio produced. Bases Loaded was announced for the JEG and mentioned in at least two magazines with internal documents slating its release for sometime in 95. The original Bases Loaded was released on the NES, with a number of sequels following until the final game, Bases Loaded 96 Double Header, which happened to release in 95, making it almost certainly the game that was being ported to the Jaguar. Batman Forever was a 1995 movie with a $100 million budget starring Val Kilmer as Batman. The movie was expected to be bigger than the first Tim Burton Batman release, so rights to a game based on it were sold off. Acclaim won the rights in May of 94 and immediately went to work on a game called Batman Forever for 16-bit and less powerful consoles. The game released around August of 95, however, that's not the game we're discussing. In addition, another non-related game called Batman Forever The Arcade Game was developed for the arcade, Saturn, PlayStation, and Jaguar. It utilized Sega's Titan architecture, an arcade board that used the same SH2 processors as the 32X and Saturn, a commonality that made porting it from the Titan to those systems fairly straightforward. The JEG, on the other hand, was a bit complicated. Probe was subcontracted as developer due to Atari's in-house staff already being stretched extremely thin. Probe, for their part, continuously delayed development before revealing that it would be a port of the PSX version and that version would need to be finished before the JEG port could begin. I don't believe Atari was happy about this, but they nonetheless accepted the circumstances with the understanding that the JEG version would be at bare minimum as good as the PSX version it was being ported from. Work that should have started in early 95 with a contracted end development date of November that same year was pushed back as Probe struggled to find a programmer who could handle the task of programming an adequate game for Atari's console. This game, in particular, is interesting as internal documents have leaked, which show Atari paid a $100,000 licensing fee, in addition to a 10% royalty on all units sold a deal very similar to what they had agreed to when licensing Batman Returns for the Lynx. In addition, we know from other internal documents that by the start of 95, Atari had already invested $25,000 into the game's development, but felt unsure about its success as it was apparent early on that probes and experience with the hardware might lead to problems down the road. We don't know how far the project got, but with probes struggle with the Jaguar platform, it was doomed from the start. Battle Lords was a hack and slash game heavily inspired by the Gauntlet series. Creative Edge started this along with a number of other games for the JEG, all headed by David Whitman. Of all their ongoing projects, only Baldi's released. Not much else is known. Battle Wheels started life as a highly praised game on the Atari Lynx prior to the launch of the Jaguar. Its developer, Beyond Games, had done a masterful job, so a next generation update was greenlit with the game going into early production even earning a spot on the Jaguar console box as an upcoming game for the system. The vehicle combat game was highly anticipated, but for unknown reasons, it was put on hold while Beyond Games made the shift to develop Ultra Vortech. Almost nothing is known about this version, but I think it's worth pointing out Beyond Games would continue to make this style of game, releasing Redline and Motor Mayhem after the Jag's demise. Core planned a number of games for the Jaguar which were essentially improved ports of Sega CD games. The list essentially mirrors the 32X, though the format of choice was the CD for the Jag. The Caveman Kart game called BC Racers was part of this group, and of the bunch had the least amount of work done if work was even started on it. As the unreleased series tends to run in mostly alphabetical order, I've included a special segment after the credits that looks at games that are often cited as being unreleased and give you the reason why they didn't make the cut here. Huge thanks to fellow obscure console enthusiast Top Hat Gaming Man, and of course, the biggest CDI fan in the world, Wrestling With Gaming. 
both for lending voice support. Special thanks to Atari Age, Jaguar Sector 3, and every individual who dedicates their time to preserving documents related to gaming history. It's only because of you that a series like this is even possible. Now, on to games that didn't make the cut. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Your support means the world to me. As always, feel free to leave a positive or negative comment down below. I try to read and reply to everyone and appreciate the opportunity to interact with you all. Until the next episode, to wherever you may be watching, good morning, good evening, and good night. I'm Genovi, and you've been watching Retro Impressions. Automaniacs was certainly in development for the Jaguar and stood as a sequel of sorts to Club Drive. The reason being, Atari held the rights to the original game, and while the same team was behind this game, Atari was no longer on board. The real question is, when did it start development, and was it intended for release during the life of the Jaguar? It's a real mixed bag out there with indicators pointing in both directions. With that said, it remains here until supporting evidence can be found. There's been a bit of hoopla about Battlezone 2000 not releasing for the JAG. It was one of the first 10 games greenlit for the system and was discussed in a number of magazines alongside a screenshot before seeming to fade into the abyss. Fortunately, this is a rather straightforward case. Evidence verifies that Battlezone 2000 was greenlit and given the number J9009. As these numbers follow a project from start to completion or abandonment, I think the answer is clear. As we now know the number assigned to Battlezone, we can verify Hoverstrike was released using that same number, ending years of speculation that Hoverstrike might indeed be Battlezone 2000, having received a new name as Atari felt the product drifted too far away from the original property. It will most likely surprise a few people who know about Battlesphere that it didn't make the list. The game is oftentimes considered one of the best ever released on the system. So what's the story here? The game was listed by Atari for the Jaguar and was in development while the system was still supported, even showing at the 95E3. However, it wasn't finished by the time Atari cut all ties with their system. The developer would continue working on the game, eventually releasing it in 2000 via publisher Skato Logic. It had a very limited pressing, making it one of the rarest, most sought after games for the system. Asteroids 2000 was rumored to exist for a couple decades, but no one had seen evidence to confirm it one way or the other. It was never announced for the JAG, but people insisted they had played a fairly competent build. The game was recently released to the public, and its programmer explained that this was only a technical demo created to help the team better understand the hardware itself. Asteroids 2000 was never meant for release or public consumption.